Well, hello there, and welcome to the south tip of Antelope Island in the Great Salt Lake in northern Utah. This is a place called Unicorn Point. Um, thanks for joining me today. I'm geology professor Sean Wilsey, out here on a really nice uh, day in the springtime before the bugs come out. It can get a little buggy out here if you come in midsummer. It's a nice cool day though, bugs are at bay. Uh, just a great day to explore the geology. And I wanted to bring you out here to show you uh, some really spectacular rocks that crop out here at Unicorn Point at the south end of the island. Uh, but first, just a little bit of lay of the land here. So we're looking due west. In fact, I can see the high rise buildings of downtown Salt Lake, more or less due east of where I'm at at the base of the Wasatch Range. As we continue to pan around looking south, these are the Ochre Mountains. The Ochre Mountains are mainly made out of uh, mostly Pennsylvanian to Permian age sedimentary rocks. Uh, the mountains over here looking to the southwest are the Stansbury Mountains, and then a continuation of them to the north, but an area that's surrounded by the Great Salt Lake is Stansbury Island. And so this is the south end of the of Antelope Island, as I said. Uh, and there's all sorts of things we could discuss here. We could talk about Lake Bonneville and all the impressive shorelines um, and the rise and fall of this big freshwater lake that resided here. We could talk about the Great Salt Lake and its rise and fall and especially fall these last few decades as a result of drier than normal uh, climate conditions. We could talk about basin and range faulting, which has uplifted the mountains of the Wasatch. It's uplifted this block of uh, rock here to form Antelope Island, along with the other mountains we've looked at here to the south and southwest. But what we really want to focus on here is the rocks we see here at Unicorn Point. And in a way, this I think I'm going to put this video with the Rock Identification with Wilsey series because the rocks here really close the loop on what we've done. Remember, if you think about the rock cycle, we started with igneous rocks, rocks that form when magma cools and crystallizes either underground or at the surface as lava from a volcano. Then we looked at rocks that could get weathered into particles, transported and deposited as sediments. We looked at a bunch of sedimentary rocks that were common. And then we wrapped up that series looking at metamorphic rocks, rocks that are heated and or undergo heat and pressure and change into metamorphic rocks. Really, we need something to close the loop though, because we haven't come all the way back full circle to igneous rocks. Well, these rocks right here will allow us to do that. So let's take a look at these and see just what kind of rocks we have here. The banding and the pattern in these is just uh, incredible. And just these are just gorgeous looking rocks. And so if you know a little bit about rocks, um, as you look at these, you'll probably say to yourself, well, I see some, I see some banding in it. Parts of it um, look like a, a metamorphic gneiss. And that's true, but we have quite a bit of the rock that is also this pink material that is, looks almost like putty or, um, you know, it, it's obviously been, it's obviously been flowing. It's obviously um, not solid rock that's being deformed here. It's behaving more plastically or ductily, if you will. And so what we have here is a rock at the very end of the metamorphic temperatures and pressures. This rock has been heated to such a degree that some of the rock, some of the minerals in the rock have started to melt. And so we have partial melting of this rock. And that means that this rock sort of has one foot in the metamorphic realm, but also one foot in the igneous realm. This rock combines both the igneous and the metamorphic uh, parts of the rock cycle. Again, some of these just really nice uh, bands and folds in this thing. So this is a rock called a migmatite, M-I-G-M-A, T-I-T-E. So a migmatite is, has some of the characteristics of a metamorphic rock, like nice, but it also has igneous rock textures as well. So it has some of the properties of an igneous rock and the crystal textures we would expect to see in something like that. Another just gorgeous um, fold right here in this, in these migmatites. 
So we're gonna kind of look around in here uh, just to show you just some of the beauty. Oh, this is this is really good here um, of these migmatites. So as we look at these closely, we see the banding, the igneous parts, but then when we look closely at these pinkish or light colored layers, we see igneous crystalline textures, a phanaritic texture, what you'd typically see in uh, an igneous rock. In fact, in some places, these, these veins, if you will, of, or I guess they're small little dikes, I suppose, of igneous material are much thicker. Here's an entire zone um, that's dominantly nice sharp contact right here with the the metamorphic rock but then it grades into more of a crystalline texture but you still get faint little blobs and inclusions of the metamorphic rock running through the igneous rock and then another nice sharp contact down here um, so just really fantastic this migmatite um, let's see. So there's a couple of spots in here where we can see some of the intense folding, uh, that occurs in some of these partially melted, um, igneous little dikes or veinlets, I suppose. Um, here's a really nice one here. And the reason we get the lighter colored material forming first. So when this rock was heated up, the material or the minerals that actually melted to form the igneous component of the migmatite were quartz, uh, sometimes a little bit of muscovite and feldspar. If you remember way back when we did our introduction to igneous rocks, we pulled up a little chart called Bowen's Reaction Series, and that showed us the order in which minerals will crystallize from melt. Well, if you think about it, this rock's working the opposite way. This rock started out as a solid existing rock, but as incrementally increasing temperatures and pressures were exerted upon this rock, um, ultimately it reached such critical temperatures that the rock started to partially melt. And the last minerals to crystallize in Bowen's reaction series, which is quartz muscovite and potassium feldspar, turns out those are the first minerals to melt in a rock. So it should come at no, no surprise then that the composition of these uh, folded bands of igneous material in this migmatite is dominantly quartz, potassium feldspar, which gives it mostly the pinkish color, and then a little bit of muscovite here and there. Really spectacular. Um, if I had, I had to ride my bike down here to get here because the gate's closed. So it was about a five mile bike ride, but if I had, um, a way to move these big rocks. These would just make really nice little landscaping rocks. So um, so there you go, a new rock type, one that sort of closes the loop on um, between igneous and metamorphic. When we see these tight folds in here, uh, these are sometimes called tigmatic folds. So if you need a fancy word for the day, and I know you do, um, tigmatic is spelled P-T-Y-G-A-M, TIC, tigmatic, or MATIC at the end. Um, so, tigmatic folds are these intense, um, very tight folds that we sometimes see. Here's another spectacular set of them right here uh, in, in these migmatites. Um, so, a little different than your standard nice, where everything's layered in the same direction. Here we have um, more intense deformation and rocks that are starting to melt partially to become um, heading back towards the igneous side of the the rock cycle. Uh, the other cool thing here is we're right on an old shoreline just above the lake here and so you can see all of these rounded rocks along this shoreline. So you can imagine when the Great Salt Lake was higher and when you get high winds across this immense huge lake the force of the wind across the face of the water can generate really large waves that come crashing in to the shoreline, breaking up some of these rocks here, these outcrops, and then weathering them, tumbling them, and forming these nice rounded uh, gravels we see here along this shoreline. So really spectacular spot, one of my favorite places on the island. Um, 
If you get a chance to come here, please take the time to come down to Unicorn Point, the south end of Antelope Island, to look at some of the migmatites. The migmatites are exposed in a couple other places on the island as well, but I think here they're maybe the most spectacular. Might be because they've been uh, sculpted and somewhat polished by all the, the wave action. Um, just really beautiful spot here. So, as always, appreciate any support you can provide. Thanks for supporting my YouTube channel. I'm happy to come to these places that I love and explain as best I can the geology, the history, uh, the rocks themselves, the landscapes, and share that with you. Um, so I hope you've enjoyed this visit here to Unicorn Point uh, at the south end of Antelope Island here in the middle of the Great Salt Lake in northern Utah.